it's most unusual to see a person in Dustin's position, an accomplice, get the death penalty when the person who actually did the murdering gets a life sentence. He didn't take a life, so why you want to take his life? I don't know where we as a people are going to benefit by taking Dustin's life. The last person standing in front of those young ladies was Willis Haynes. He's the one that pulled the trigger again and again and again. Dustin, as a child, was a happy boy, and he was a regular young boy. He got in very little trouble. He was very, very close and protective to his mother. Dustin was Marilyn, my sister Marilyn's whole world. Everything revolved around Dustin. Dustin was just as doting to Marilyn as Marilyn was to Dustin. And they had a special bond. I, I know that Dustin's father, Alfonso Higgs, had a tendency to be mean to Marilyn. Marilyn was a single mother and was in an abusive relationship with Dustin's father, Alfonso. Alfonso would beat Dustin's mother in front of him, and Dustin would try to intervene, often getting hurt himself in the process. Dustin's father paid a minimal attention to Dustin. He was always too busy with whatever else he was involved in. But he did not play a father's role in Dustin's life. I did like Dustin's father. I didn't like it because he had other children and he was still doing the same, dealing with drugs. And he lived around the corner on Mansion Street and he was dealing right out of his house. Dustin grew up in a rough area of Poughkeepsie where crime and drug abuse were rampant. Dustin was very protective of who came in the house, what they were there for. I think he was afraid that somebody might come in the house that might be more like Alfonso from after I find out well, how bad Alfonso was. Dustin's mother was diagnosed with breast cancer when Dustin was eight years old. Marilyn's doctor had missed an earlier diagnosis, so by the time she found out, the cancer had already metastasized. At a young age, when his mother became sick, he was responsible for the household. He was responsible for caring for his mother. He would feed her, he would dress her, he would take care of the apartment. He became the head of the house, and of course, she became the child. Dustin had kind of a change of a personality. He lost contact with a lot of his friends, taking care of his mother. And um, the stress of going to school and trying to keep up on his schoolwork, he had problems with that. He did the best he could. He was, he was only, what, 10 years old. Initially, when she was first diagnosed, of course, she responded to the treatments. But as the cancer increased, of course, she became weaker and weaker. And Dustin took care of his mother more and more. Marilyn, at the end of her Ill illness, was almost an invalid. I'm even going to the doctor, she was not able to make it up the stairs or into the elevator. And my brother Richie had to carry her everywhere she went. She was, just became bedridden. Dustin, that was kind of surprised that at 10 years old, he wanted to take part in his mother's funeral arrangements, making sure we had our glasses, making sure it was the right dress that we had picked out to use for her with the right dress and the right colors and he picked out her shoes and he was very involved and I was worried at one time because he didn't act like a kid and I think he was holding everything inside. When his mother passed away, Dustin was like isolated. He wanted, he didn't want to be around anyone. He would just get up and walk out, and he, and he might walk all over Poughkeepsie. Someone might say to you, I saw Dustin here, I saw Dustin there. And then when he came to Stasburg to live with us, he still had the same behavior. He would disappear and just go for a walk, and you'd say, where were you? And he might have just been in the woods. He wouldn't talk. He would 
be sitting there and sometime I go to my sister at Connie's house and the kids would be on the back deck and they're all running and Dustin would peek over by the car and just sit by himself for a while. But he, he never got over that, losing his mother, because she was always there for Dustin, very protective for Dustin. I tried my best, but I could not be his mother. January of 1996, the bodies of three young women were found on a road in Prince George's County that was a state road that happened to wind through federal property known as the Patuxent Wildlife Center. There was a social date between the three young men and the three young women. At some point in the evening, the um, relationship deteriorated and when uh, they were to be driven home, uh, Dustin Hicks was driving his vehicle. Uh, Willis Haynes was the right front seat passenger and uh, Victor Gloria was in the back of the vehicle behind the young women. At some point uh, that evening, the, uh, the car went uh, into this Patuxent wildlife area. Uh, the vehicle stopped. Willis Haynes got out of the vehicle and proceeded to shoot all three women and they left the bodies in the road. The crime went unsolved for three years until statements made by Victor Gloria gave police a break in the case. Initially in his statement, Victor Gloria told the police that um, he had nothing to do with it, didn't know what they were talking about with regard to the crime. Uh, later on, he uh, gave them more details, brought Willis's name into it, and they asked him uh, in, as part of his statement why he didn't tell them at first, and he said he was terrified that Willis would harm him or his kids. Willis was just a dangerous character. When I met Dustin Higgs, I was 13. We lived across the street from the basketball court in Beltsville. So we would go over there and play basketball, shoot the breeze. So it became like a everyday summer thing. My father, Wendell, had a stroke and a heart attack. He was there to make sure my father, my mother made it to the grocery store, uh, grocery runs, made sure she needed anything. You know, became like, uh, Dustin Higgs became like another son of her and a brother of mine. That was the type of person he was. If he had it in his pocket, you had it in yours. If he was putting food in, if Dustin was putting food in his mouth, he was putting food in your mouth. He was a good boyfriend. He was very attentive. Um, he wanted me to finish school, and he made sure I was up and at it every morning. And um, he would like do things for my grandmother as far as like changing her tires, um, if she needed her car wash, you know, little things, running to the store for her. I mean, he's, he was a big help to my family. I met Dustin his senior year when I was teaching in Hyde Park at Franklin Delano Roosevelt High School. Dustin was diagnosed as learning disabled. It was nonspecific, but he seemed to have a lot of difficulty with writing, putting words on paper, formulating ideas. He had some emotional problems, I think because he lost his mother at the end of third grade. So in addition to his learning disabilities, he had some sadness because he was grieving. And he had these big, dark, sad eyes. He was very shy, withdrawn, but a nice kid. He was just nice. He wasn't rude. He didn't curse. He didn't. He was a follower. They would start fooling around, and he would kind of go with with what his friends were doing, but Dustin really, he never seemed to be the one who initiated any kind of fooling around or, or any other activities. Nothing in my testing indicated Dustin to be a violent person. I saw him more as a frightened, scared person who tried to keep others not realizing that and keep people away from him, basically but nothing in his testing indicated that he was a violent or aggressive individual. He rejected his father's role. He rejected his father's abuse of women. 
He saw himself as protecting women, not assaulting or attacking them. This drawing uh, was done uh, by uh, Dustin Higgs uh, three days before his 28th birthday. And it is the quality uh, that one would find of a young adolescent, um, more of a nine or 10 year old than that would be of a 28 year old. Um, and it reflects his emotional development, not as a 28 year old, uh, strong adult male who now stands uh, six foot uh, four inches tall and weighs 174 pounds, but rather the opposite, the very weak, inadequate individual uh, who has no sense of self or sense of strength, basically. One of the issues that was never really addressed and clarified at trial was really how immature Dustin was. Uh, at the time that 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 this happened, um, the you know while he was in fact uh, in chronological years you know in his early twenties, um, from a psychiatric point of view, developmentally he was really uh, as a stock you know uh, in 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 his uh, early teen years, and so the 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 nature and quality of his decision-making processes, you know. So from the standpoint of being able to um, assess what's going on around him and use that information to kind of understand and appreciate the situation you find yourself in, from the standpoint of being able to uh, come up with hypothetical alternative ways for you to address the situation you find yourself in and weigh the pros and cons of that, considering what are the long-term consequences of things that you're doing. He wasn't able to do any of that in any sort of uh, reasonable way, and so he was really like a young teenager. The prosecution in Dustin's case claimed that Dustin was the dominant one in his relationship with Willis and that he had ordered Willis to shoot the girls. In a signed affidavit, Willis wrote, Dustin didn't threaten me. I was not scared of him. Dustin didn't make me do anything, that night or ever. The prosecution said that Dustin ordered Willis to kill the three young women. And that doesn't find any support in our investigation. Uh, everybody that we spoke with thought that it, uh, it was absurd that Dustin, of all people, who was not a very forceful person, could control Willis, who no one else was able to control. Willis's trial had come first, and the prosecution presented a very different story. When Willis was tried, the prosecution tried to make it out as though he was acting on his own. In the closing argument of the prosecutor, she told the jury, when you look at the past behavior of Mr. Haynes, you will see the choices that he makes in his life, and they suit only Mr. Haynes. He chooses when to kill and when to scare. He chooses when to threat and when to carry it out. They go on to say, this is the murderer. He did it. He killed those girls. When the prosecution failed to get a death sentence for Willis, they changed their theory of the case to make Dustin the primary aggressor in time for Dustin's trial. As the accomplice, Dustin was only eligible for the death penalty because the crime had been committed on federal land. Had the crime been committed just down the road, on Maryland land, Dustin would not have been eligible for the death penalty. It was critically important to the government's case that Victor Gloria testify that there was some comment passed between Dustin Higgs and um, Willis Haynes, and that he actually saw a handgun passed from Dustin Higgs to Willis Haynes. They could not have secured a conviction, let alone a death sentence, without that testimony. Now, Victor Gloria had given several inconsistent statements when I interviewed Victor Gloria shortly before he was released from custody, he told me that he had in fact been asleep throughout the incident and was only awakened by the sound of the gunshot. While Willis received a life sentence, 
Dustin was sentenced to die by lethal injection. The jury in Dustin's case heard nothing about Dustin's learning disabilities and heard very little about his difficult upbringing. Our mitigation specialist testified at trial that Dustin was an average student uh, to a good student, that he met all of his uh, development marks on time, that he was fairly well adjusted in school. And now we see that that was hardly the case, that uh, Dustin had a long record of being identified as a learning disabled child, that the counseling that was recommended was never given, and there were there things that the jury should have known, that we had a duty to bring before the, this jury that just never got before the jury. And uh, frankly, I'm just really appalled to find out that there are over 500 pages of uh, special education records that we never saw. If we had had these records, we would have approached the defense presentation differently. We would have used at least one more expert to explain how these early educational problems and deficits affect somebody's life and the impact that it had on Dustin's path in life. We try to empower each of the jurors to think about that and to stand by their principles. If we could just get to one, that's all it takes to save a person's life. And frankly, with these records, with these additional witnesses that we now certainly would have called, I'm convinced that we could have done that. I think we could have saved his life. Dustin has now been on death row for 16 years. Dustin's appeals have been exhausted, and he's never had the opportunity to present the new evidence that we've developed at a hearing. And now clemency is his last resort, the only thing that can save his life. Dustin has a son named Daquan, who was born after Dustin was arrested. I was trying to ask the guards, is there like a room that you can take the babies just so he can hold them, you know? For a second they was like, no, you know, everything is behind the partition, the glass, so. I know he needs his father and I know his father needs him in his life also. They email back and forth like every day and um, he's always calling, so he is a very dedicated father. Could you tell us your name? Daquan. Your name is Daquan? Okay. Uh, Daquan, do you know how old you are? How many is that? One, two, three. Tell me about your daddy. My daddy loves me. He loves you? Okay. Do you talk to him on the telephone? Over there on the phone? Well, you're a good little boy. And I'm very glad that you, you talked to me. This is a letter that I received from my dad. Um, what's up, Daquan? How are things going with you? I pray that when this letter reaches you, that it may find you in the best of hell. I must take a moment to say how proud of you that I am. Your mother informed me of the many things that you are transpiring with. She said that you have recently received a few letters from from some colleges that are interested in having you attend that school. How is the debate club coming along? He wants to be a lawyer so that he can free his dad from prison and you know that's why he's so diligent in his schoolwork and he stays on the honor roll because he's like I'm going to be a lawyer and I'm going to help my father get out of jail and like everything he does he relates it to Dustin. My father to me like he's very special to me he cares deeply for me, and he always wants me to be on the right track. He doesn't want me to end up where he is, so he always leads me in the right direction. If he wasn't in my life, I wouldn't know what to do. I'd probably, I wouldn't know where I'd be, because it seems like every time I'm always into some trouble, or every time I feel like I'm about to do something wrong, I can always like kind of hear my father's telling me, choose the right friends, 
um, don't be a follower. He's my motivation in life. If Dustin was executed, that would seriously hurt Daquan. He would want justice to be served correctly, so that would be a big injustice if his father would, you know, be executed. But just the way he took care of his mother, that, that, that shows how he cared for all of us. He had to bathe her, he had to feed her, clothe her, everything. Dustin would not harm anyone like that, like they say he did. Dustin is all I have left of Maryland. Dustin is my last link to Maryland. What I'm hoping for, and I think the family hoping for, is just to get Dustin off a of death row. Just get him in the general population, and then we still have Maryland here with us. And we can still visit Dustin. And the other thing is I can't see any, I can't see any benefit. From what I understand, Dustin didn't do the killing. And I can't see the benefit of taking his life. I, did. I don't know where we as a people are going to benefit by taking Dustin's life. A lot of the things that um, Dustin has done, I kind of blame myself for them. You know, I say, well, I should have kept better track of this, or I should have paid, and you can't go around saying the rest of your life, I should have, could have, would have. So a lot of it I do blame myself for. But I definitely don't want him to be sentenced to any harm or danger any more than just being locked up. I don't even want to think about it. I really don't even want to think about it, because just talking about it, I, I, 